So it looks like we're about one minute into the hour. So why don't we get started? Um, so, and really what this is, is we've got a number of experts that are really good in each one of their different um, experienced um, kind of facets. Uh, and we are kicking this off as experts nominating two to three different companies that they've kind of viewed in their world as being extraordinarily ready for the future, um, probably embracing of change and trends, and somebody that's probably creating great impact and value in the marketplace. As mentioned, Andrew and myself have been doing these for a full season now. Um, and it's interesting, we sit at the edge of 2020. So 2020, we're talking about 2020 focused vision, moving into a new decade. And in our previous webcast, we talked about, my Lord, if we were sitting in 2010, how would we have conducted this discussion? And would we have identified the companies that truly made it through to 2020 with, with flying colors? I don't know if Uber would have been on our list at that point in time. I don't know if um, a number of the different sharing economy examples, they might have been. It was probably on the cusp of being there. So I'll be curious to know who we, we end up nominating today. And so we're talking tech platforms, experience and engagement. And if you're going to anoint somebody to be winning an award, you probably need to define the category that they're winning in. And so um, myself and Andrea, we weren't the first to mint or codify this term called future proofing, but it's certainly about people that are embracing the future um, in the spirit that's intended hopefully to be faster and bolder and simpler and friendlier. Um, the book that we're writing together, its tagline is the future beyond innovation. So we think people uh, have a broader perspective that are future proofers. Um, they're building either great growth, great value, um, or impact. Uh, and generally, I think we'll talk about this in general terms today. It's just organizations, companies, and brands doing remarkable things. And so these are the four topics we're going to talk about today. And as mentioned as well, we are going to be opening this up to the public. So anybody that's interested in the future can actually nominate some of their own brands, companies, and organizations um, that um, should follow along the lines of, um, you know, best in class, best in industry. And so that portal will be up in January. So more formally now, I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, I've uh, known or worked with some of them for a period of time. Uh, John Coatsier, hailing from Vancouver today. Uh, he, yes, he is CEO of Sparkplug9, but he's so much more than that. He wears so many different professional hairnets. He's a Forbes contributor that I've seen a number of his articles that always engage me. He's a columnist, he's a journalist, he's a futurist, he's a dreamer. He uh, is also VP of Insights at Singular. And he focuses a lot of his time in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, whether it's robotics or technology or mobile. Um, in terms of generalist, uh, I don't know a person that's as generalist on the technology and what it means to business than John is. So I'm so glad to have him today. John, say hi. I'm muted, but uh, yes, hi. I'm, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I do want to point out as well, uh, he's got so many different things going on. John has remodeled just as of this week, I think, his website. So, um, so check out johncoatseer.com just to get a, a sense of what he's up to. Um, and he'll be talking about technology today. Uh, I also want to introduce Lars Ibb. Uh, he is CEO of the Business Institute in Denmark, which is in Aalborg, uh, which uh, I kind of had the... Uh, the great service of learning a lot more about before we got on the call today. Um, he is not only a lecturer, which he says, he goes out of his way to say he's not only a lecturer, but he's an executive, he's a chairman of seven different companies, um, and he deals across a full gamut of business strategy and management. Um, he's joining us again from Denmark today, and um, welcome on board, Lars. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the coming discussion. Happy to be here. Wonderful. I, I love the fact that we have always global panels. Uh, I, I love the fresh insights. Uh, there are worlds beyond New York, Silicon Valley, and, uh, and London, right? All right. And then last but not least, of course, we've got Jean Bliss. Um, she's president of Customer Bliss, conveniently enough. Um, it's funny when you, when you look at it, and I apologize, your Twitter handle is probably different. Tell, before I go further, we've got Mark from our previous webinar on your Twitter handle. Uh, you'll, you'll have to tell the audience where your Twitter handle is as well. But um, she's CEO of company Customer Bliss. Um, she, I've known uh, her reputation probably precedes her. She's, she's kind of spoken on the stages around the world. Uh, I love her idea of helping companies become the best version of themselves is kind of core to what Jean does. Um, 
and uh, she's been a previous chief customer officer to a number of different high profile companies. And her last book, I think the last time we talked to each other, we were talking about your last book, which was, uh, I think, entitled, Would You Do That to Your Mother? And yeah. Using Your Mom as the Standard for Great Customer Experience. So, um, so welcome aboard. And please, uh, I apologize on your Twitter handle and tell people where people uh, can find you on Twitter. Sure. It, thank you. It's at Jean Bliss. Um, and I um, also just redesigned my website. Lots of new content around becoming the best version of yourself. So thank you. I can testify to that. I was just on there trying to steal some stuff from it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then I'm going to treat my co-host, Andrea Cates, as one of our illustrious panelists this time, as opposed to just a co-host, because um, she's going to talk about platforms today. So, Andrea, um, thank you for switching hats up. Excited so, to talk about platforms. So in terms of format, I mean, I think we're going to keep this kind of broad and make it brisk as a conversation. Hopefully we'll chat about your specific category that you're in charge of today, panelists, and why it's important for the future. You're going to expose a couple of different companies, two or three different companies, and um, not only who they are and why they're remarkable, but um, also kind of reasons why that maybe we can tease out in terms of why they're great and how other companies can work with them or imitate them. Um, we do have a global panel today, so I'm curious about the global and regional considerations that we have. Um, the forces driving change in your category, and obviously we've got a listenership that really wants to know, how do I bring these principles back into my own company? Um, and so right off the top, I am going to um, pass it to John. I'm curious, John, um, let's start broad. Technology. Why, and, and this may seem like a um, kind of just, I'm putting it on the tee for you to swat, but um, why is technology so important for the next decade of business? Well, we're pretty certain that every company is now a technology company, right? How people consume information, how they find out about the world, how they experience the world is moderated, is mediated by technology. That's the case uh, since the desktop, that's the case especially since the small computer in our hand, and that's gonna be increasingly the case as we put the computer on our face and we've got smart glasses and we, we actually perceive the world through filters of alternate realities that uh, help us to focus on certain things and avoid other things. So as we look at technology, every company is a technology company because that's how you're addressing and, 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 and meeting the needs of your customers. So one of the things, of course, there that, that people are, are seeing a lot of, and that's been a big thing in business for the past number of years, but increasingly this year, is digital transformation, right? Uh, which, by the way, if you're on LinkedIn and you try and do a digital transformation hashtag, you find out that nobody can spell that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> There's like four spellings of that on LinkedIn. How I define that is digital transformation is doing business in the modern era as if you were a small general store from 100 years ago. You know your customer, your customer knows you, you know what your customer loves and needs, and your customer loves dealing with you, right? And so you learn a lot about your customer, and your customer learns a lot about you. It's been really interesting this past year. You mentioned that I'm a generalist, right? So I mostly focus on the fourth industrial revolution type technologies, robotics, AI, other things like that, consumer electronics to some degree. But I had the pleasure and privilege this past year of interviewing the chief technical officer and the chief, chief technology officer and the chief um, digital officer of State Farm. And State Farm, if you're an American, you know State Farm, you know, probably globally, they're pretty well known as well. I mean, 80,000 employees, uh, the biggest insurance company in the U.S. And they tried to digitally transform for years and failed. And the CTO was real upfront about it and said, hey, you know, we tried, we tried, and we failed. And they brought this new chief digital officer on and they actually, uh, they had a burning platform for change and to connect all the dots and make it all fit, make it, make it so that information flowed and they could tell who was visiting them, what they needed and how to deal with them and how to understand who they were on whatever platform those people came to deal with them. So that was really, really neat. Then I also had the, the pleasure of interviewing the uh, chief digital officer of NASCAR. Uh, 
And so NASCAR, uh, I, I didn't know NASCAR had a chief digital officer. I mean, when I think NASCAR, and you know, I'm a little outside the demographic, and you know, if we're talking to business and technology people, probably most of us are a little bit outside the demographic. I'm going out on a limb there, so, but probably most of us are a little outside the demo there. But they have a chief digital officer, and it's super interesting what they're doing. What I learned by interviewing him is that some of the drivers who currently drive in NASCAR, the actual physical cars that drive around the track, started their career in NASCAR's games, esports hmm. games. And so these drivers started out driving like this, and now they're driving a real car like that. That's pretty cool. And what NASCAR is doing in terms of bringing in new fans and engaging new fans in the esports areas, but also in terms of uh, AI and bringing in predictions so you can uh, draft a fantasy team. You know, I don't, I don't do it, but maybe you play fantasy football or you play fantasy hockey and you draft your team and the team with the most points and the most goals and assists does really well. You can do that in NASCAR as well. And they actually did, did some work with AI so you can actually see results in the middle of a race and redraft. I think this guy's going to do better. The AI is predicting he's going to do well. His car's looking good, that sort of thing, right? So super, super interesting here. Why this matters, this is the battle for the future, right? Uh, startups have an advantage here because they can build from the ground up. It's like what we used to call developing economies can skip generations of old technology and go straight to the future, which we saw China do very, very successfully over the past decade in terms of going mobile first across the board with WeChat and mobile payments and everything like that, right? But big businesses still have the customers. And so here's the race. Can the startups steal customers faster than the dinosaurs can rewire themselves? So I picked a couple of companies to chat about, Sean. I don't know if you want me to dive right into those or if you have some comments here as well. Well, I, I logged, I keep on writing notes during these discussions. It's horrible. I wrote down NASCAR and State Farm. So you've got two more companies on top of this. You are over delivering already, which is great. Um, so, so I'm not interpreting those as your two nominees yet. You've got two other ones. You got it. You're, you're, we're on the same page. All right. I'll, I'll ask one thing. I'm not going to play contrarian because you know I'm, I'm probably more on your side of the fence about technology, but we did have an interesting observation in our last webcast that I'd love to, uh, for you to address. Um, really smart guy, uh, Mark, um, had mentioned, you know what? Technology, yes, is a defining trade of business in the future, but it's quite commoditized. Um, everybody's working on a blockchain thing if you're in fintech and everybody's working or at least surrounding themselves in AI and, and maybe it's trying to build a better mousetrap, but his observation was, yeah, you know what? Generally, over the last 20 years, it wasn't the first person in tech to be the you know, ruler of that industry or whatever. It was somebody that came along a little bit later that actually did something with the tech. Um, you got a thought on that? I absolutely do. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm a journalist, right? So I write stuff. And we have an old phrase in journalism, if it, lead, if, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, we can reverse that in business technology. If it leads, it bleeds. <laughs> right? So <laughs> absolutely, I agree. First mover advantage does have some, some benefit if you get it right. The problem is there's so many ways to get it wrong. And the technology, some can say maybe it's commoditized. The problem is not accessing the technology. The problem is getting the right pieces of technology in place at the right time and in integrating those well into your process and into who your company is. One of the key things that State Farm did is they rediscovered what made them State Farm before they went out and bought a lot of technology. And that was, hey, we are your neighbor, neighborly uh, insurance dealer. I don't deal with them. I'm not promoting them in any way, shape or form. I'm Canadian, so, <laughs> but that's what they, that's how they, that's how they present. That's their brand. And they found a way to make that, replicate that on, in an app, on the phone, in other ways like that. And so that was really cool. It's rediscovering who you are and, in, and, and empowering that with technology to be that at scale. So I, 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 I agree largely with what the person was saying, uh, but I have a little different twist on it. Nice. Well, that may pivot into the two. Um, you could have chosen thousands of different companies on this one, um, yes. given what you cover. You've decided to choose two. Um, you know, don't let me wait any further. Tell me what the two that you're going to profile for us. Awesome. I, I, I picked uh, two vastly different companies in vastly different spaces. One is an entertainment company, and it's TikTok. 
so I'm assuming everybody here knows of TikTok, has heard of TikTok. Essentially, TikTok is digital crack cocaine, right? Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't pretend to be anything other than pure entertainment in 10 to 20 second packages, and it delivers on that. And I, I'm, you know, I like to be cutting edge, uh, but I'm a latecomer here. I downloaded TikTok uh, probably a couple months ago. Right, uh, because guess what? I was doing a report on it, <laughs> and I needed to understand what I was talking about as I was using some of the data. So I spent some time in there, and you can lose five hours in TikTok <laughs> and wake up on the other side with a beard and wonder, hey, am I Rip Van Winkle or something like that? <laughs> but this is interesting. They had 614 million new app installs in 2019. We have not seen that kind of scale and that kind of explosive growth since Pokemon Go a number of years ago. That is literally earth shaking. It's groundbreaking. It's amazing. One of the companies that I consult with, which is uh, Singular, and I'm VP Insights there, uh, we measure and, and monitor and analyze ad spend for companies. Uh, over $10 billion annually uh, for customers like Twitter and Lyft and others like that. Ad spend on TikTok grew 75x from May to November. Ad spend on TikTok grew 75 times from May to November of this year. So what's interesting here, TikTok doesn't pretend to be anything other than pure entertainment. You get it. It's interesting, it's fun, it's kind of crazy. This is a huge threat to a number of different companies. There's the obvious, right? The obvious is it's a threat to Facebook. The obvious is it's a threat to Snapchat. Uh, somewhat less obvious, it's a threat to YouTube. Somewhat less obvious, it's a threat to gaming. In fact, it's a threat to any entertainment or media company that wants your time, your attention, your engagement, right? And especially traditional media. As far as those uh, appeal to youth anyways, right? We have an explosion of entertainment these days. Uh, I, I, I tweeted something the other day, uh, which is that Netflix released more shows last year than the entire TV industry did in 2005. Hmm. More new shows and movies than the entire TV industry in 2005. Amazing, incredible tens of billions of dollars are being poured into content for Netflix, for Disney Plus, for Apple Plus, Apple TV Plus, for HBO, uh, Hulu, all of these uh, companies that are out there competing for our time and our attention. And guess what? Here's something where there's a platform, very, very simple platform. Kids are jumping on it. They're creating videos. Some older people are as well. And they are stealing massive amounts of time and attention. Average time in the app is over 50, 50 minutes a day and uh, probably about 500 million active daily users uh, today. So that's the first company that I picked. Well, I have a number of follow-ups, but I don't have time in this discussion. So we'll do a, like a full TikTok at some point. Um, you said your second company, though, was going to be something completely different. So, um, so give me the gamut. What's the other one? The second one is a direct-to-consumer company. Of course, we've seen a ton of direct -to consumer companies in retail space, in the retail space over the past year or so. And the one I'm gonna talk about is Allbirds. And, and so we know that direct -to consumer is, is, is pretty significant revolution in retail, right? It's an ex excellent example of knowing your customer, being close to your customer, walking with your customer and selling directly to your customer. And we've seen billion dollar exits here, right? Dollar Shave Club, that sort of thing. The reason I picked Allbirds is that we live in an era of platforms. And every company, no matter what you do or where you do, has to deal with, use, work around, and somehow succeed in this era of platforms. So if you're in retail, <clears throat> whether you're direct to consumer or not, you've got to deal with Amazon, which is the world's largest platform or the Western world's largest platform for retail. Shouldn't uh, include China in that, in that uh, characterization. Amazon has this interesting thing. They see what's going on in the world and they copy stuff and they release their own version of it. They've released their own version of the Instant Pot. They blatantly copied the Allbirds shoes, the look, the material, in some sense, not all senses, and then uh, they start selling it for about $35, undercutting by about 75 bucks what the Allbirds cost. So what made me pick Allbirds is Allbirds' response to this. 
you could just go and complain about it. You could just go and publicize it. You could just go and hire a lawyer or <laughs> try and go up against Amazon in the court of law. You'd probably be tied up for five years. What the founder and CEO did is wrote a medium post about it. So I did publicize it, did complain about it a little bit, but the pure genius here is that he offered Allbirds open source technology for making its shoes sustainably to Amazon. So most shoes and Amazon shoes use petroleum to make their foam, the stuff that makes them squishy, the stuff that makes them comfortable as you're walking and running around. Allbirds uses the waste stream from sugar cane, uh, product, using sugar cane in production to create sugar, that sort of thing. So they're using a waste product to make something that you can put on your feet. It's much more eco-friendly. You're not having to, to, to drill for oil. You're not having to use a, 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 a perfectly good substance. You're using something that's quote unquote useless and transforming it into something that's useful. And they offered Amazon the tech. That's a massive burn, but it's totally in line with its brand. And they made a massive marketing move that resonates with its market and deals with the reality of a small company in a world of large platforms. So that's why I picked them second. Wow, so it's almost like what Linux did to the tech universe and making it open source, they're trying to do themselves, I guess. Uh, trying in to make some sense, yes. Um, wow, all right, uh, and just quickly before we move on to Lars and our, our uh, customer engagements out of the discussion, what's the one thing, given your two examples, is there any common link or something that says for people that look to reapply these things, Here's some forces uh, or tips of, of where that's all going and how you might want to reapply this, these success models. Well, when I think about all birds, they did the unexpected. You have a retail company, they make and, and ship these shoes. They open sourced their, their, their trade secret. They open sourced how they actually make their product. That's not typical. That's not normal. That's business at not as usual. And that's leading to a lot of success for them. So that's really, really cool. And then for TikTok, I mean, you know, make something that's fun, give away for free and somehow catch on with the youth market and you have the opportunity to grow, grow, grow. Interesting. Uh, I find social media fascinating because forever it used to be every three years, your favorite social media site changed. And then for a decade, it stopped. We all yes. just... Facebook kept on gobbling up stuff. So TikTok may be the, the new Trojan horse, perhaps. All right, we're going to come back to you later, but I do want to move to our next three topics as well. Um, equally fascinating. Um, actually, I've got experience here. So um, we've got experience second in line. So Gene, I don't know if you're, uh, I said you were going third. Do you want to go second? Happy to go second. All right, there you go. So convenient. I have the same question for you, and I'm guessing I'm going to have an impassioned uh, Sermon on the Mount speech about why customer experience is so important to your 2020s, but um, why don't you tell us why? Sure. Well, and, you know, here's what I am also, um, and first of all, John, I loved what you had to say because so much of it is about putting the best version of yourself out to the world and then building your operating plan and your DNA around it, using technology as an enabler of it versus technology wagging the tail of the, of the company. And that's really what you're gonna hear from me in a minute. Um, the other thing that you said, which is important, which clicks right into what I'm about to say is that customer experience at its foundation is about leaders, leadership. It's about the bravery of leaders choosing how they will and will not grow. As we give things labels like customer experience, we, we are at risk of falling away from the purposeful guidance and leadership of choosing the behaviors we'll take and choosing the things we won't do, your non-negotiables. And so what the reason why experience but connected with leadership bravery is important because we are living in a marketplace where people are deciding about the companies they're gonna deal with, work with, give their money to, stay connected to, based on how they act as people, based on not what they do, but how they do it to improve lives, to honor people, and to earn what I call admirable growth. And I think we're in, a, in an era of people choosing in a very deliberate way, differently than they have in the past. You know, I make decisions every day about leaving companies or staying with companies um, based on these attributes. Um, and I'd love to hear what others have to say. So experience is on everybody's mission statement, but it can also become everything and nothing. And so I'm pushing 
on that with with my folks out there to say it, this has got to be about deliberateness and and as you mentioned when you introduced me becoming and showing the best version of yourself in the marketplace i love it and i think um i think in general a lot of these categories um the definition of this it, we probably talked about customer experience back in 2010 and probably 2000 as well but what falls underneath that might be quite different i find there's there's a broader landscape. You brought up leadership bravery, which I'm not too sure if we would have talked about in 2000 as, as explicitly, yeah. but now it's so important, right? Really critically important. And, 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 I, and the world has changed. You know, we've got people just fundamentally, especially, I'm, I'm not going to call them millennials. That world drives me crazy. It's not, like there's so many different labels. But as human beings, we're making choices differently. And I think now we're able to really recognize that and um you know the companies that are really admired it's not because they did journey mapping or because they have a voc program it's because they deliberately chose to enable their people to rise they deliberately um come to market in a different way they deliberately de develop their products differently and it's all about really recognizing the human that they're serving and supporting and recognizing the employee whose job it is um, to deliver that experience and that value. And, and, and that's where I think we're losing um, the meaning in the mechanics of the work. And so I'm, I, I don't want to sound like a negative in this, but I think that we have an opportunity to raise the water level on this work that we're doing so that it's, it's really connected to what I call your three blocks long. How will you be remembered? Um, how do you, you know, I tell a story on, on my new website about my dad. He had a Buster Brown shoe store in Des Plaines, Illinois. And uh, this man, you know, he wasn't wealthy, but he was prosperous. He had, he had prosperity and uh, he served a generation of children and their children's children. And when he retired, a line of people three blocks long, including Mrs. McCaskey of the Bears with a shirt signed by all the Chicago Bears, stood in line to say goodbye to this man that buying shoes would never be the same. And so I think we need to build for our legacy and recognize that, you know, we need to know it. You mentioned the story um, about the, the organization that, um, oh, State Farm. They went back to their roots about who they are and what their purpose is. And that's being leapfrogged over in so many, over 90% of transformations. We're not doing that hard work of deciding who are we and what are the attributes as human beings that we want to show up in our operating model. And then finally, as leaders, are we living those behaviors in our personal behavior, in how we respond to cataclysmic events, in how we enable our people to be trusted, um, because that's really, I think, that, that's the opportunity to raise this work from tactical incremental change to becoming an elevated kind of company. So um, I'm going to pause for a sec. See what well, I, I mean, I love your, uh, I feel like uh, I'm going to walk over the fire coals with you together, that you're impassioned <laughs> uh, kind of plea for purpose and, uh, and great behavior. Are there, and, and this is, I guess, the money question for our, today's discussion, are there two or three companies in your mind that embody what you've just talked about that you go, well, you know, if I was investing in great customer experience companies uh, and uh, based on what you just said, these are two or three role model companies I would want to, um, to look at. I actually have three and then a fourth that I just want to mention really briefly. So um, first of all, Virgin Hotels started by, and, and in collaboration with our great friend, uh, Richard Branson, um, from the very beginning, they decided that they were going to walk away from legacy practices that define the hotel experience. You know, who of us loves cracking open a $7 bottle of water in the middle of the night? Um, what happens is these, these ways for companies to earn revenue are because somebody's run a spreadsheet and said, look, if we charge an extra $6 for pillows or change fees or whatever, and companies get addicted to these fees instead of really earning their growth by elevating their experience, their people. And so Raul Leal, the CEO of a Virgin Hotel said, look, we consider Wi-Fi a right, not a revenue stream. They also don't charge you to deliver your room service or um, any other number of uh, bad service experiences that we're equating with the hotel experience they've walked away from. 
they do something they call street pricing. So they, they, in the very beginning, and I think they still do this now, their managers go out to the corner market and see how much a Snicker bar costs, a water, a can of Coke, and they won't charge you more in that your hotel room. They've got a basket of, of goodies than you could get from your, your corner market. So they don't pen you in to, um, they don't charge you what they can, they charge you what's fair. And you know, they've exploded. They're, they're expanding over two, 300% around the market. Um, they've won every kind of Condé Nast Traveler Award because again, we're gravitating toward people with good behavior. You know, you've got to back that up with a good experience. It can't be a kumbaya, but that's my first one. And I'm kind of really enamored by that. All right, give us the other two. I, I want to hear all of them. The second one is Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is, uh, you know, think of them, you mentioned Netflix as the Netflix for clothes. Um, for people who don't know who Stitch Fix are, is, they are somebody who helps uh, folks who have a hard time putting their wardrobe together. And they do it in a number of ways, which I think is kind of magical. Number one, when you first sign up, they ask you for, uh, they ask you questions, not about if you want a red shirt or a blue shirt, but how you live your life. So they start to build a personal dossier about who you are as a person versus the tactical thing of, you know, what kind of pants you want. The second thing they ask you to do is they ask you to send in your Pinterest pins if you're so inclined. So now they're starting to get a visual depiction. Then what they do is they apply AI. So now they're creating commonalities of people who like you who are gravitating toward the next, the same thing. But the fourth thing they do is what's so often missing is the blend of humanity, you know, using high tech to enable high touch. So they have over 4,000 stylists who now look at and build these boxes of five things or so that they send to you. They talk to you personally. They look at your behavior of what you return, but they also build a relationship. My girlfriend Mindy was going through breast cancer and she said to her stylist, uh, I need some comfy clothes for the next couple months or so. And of course she got the comfy clothes, but that was followed by a bouquet with a personal note. And where other retailers are going downhill, this company, you know, over 600 million, you know, they're, they're growing exponentially because again, this blend of knowing who they are and applying every version of high tech and high touch, but using high tech only when they first figured out who they are and what they're going to deliver. It's rare, right? Like just being able to apply both that smart technology with um, authenticity and uh, intimacy um, is extraordinarily rare, I think you would say. It really is. And I think that the critical thing, especially as we're, we, we have so many tools and things available to us, is to not drop into the shiny objectism of it all. You know, um, AI is about what I'm telling people, it's about building your respect delivery machine. AI is about respecting and knowing who my customer is, building a you know me experience. It's not about AI for AI's sake. And so again, we've got to start with the purpose of these tools, not start with what we're, you know, let's get excited about AI or social, you know, now we're, if we don't, we're building a silo around AI versus an expansive, um, you know, purpose-driven organization. My third example is, is Cleveland Clinic. I have been um, friends with them, followed them. Um, they've got a wonderful chief customer officer and, or chief experience, client experience officer. Um, but what's interesting about what they've done is that the humanity and the humility, uh, Toby Cosgrove, the CEO, many years ago brought everybody together and said, look, people um, appreciate what we do technically, but they don't like us very much. And in healthcare, you know, I was just at the doctor this morning. It's just the, the woman didn't look me in the eyes, you know? And, and so we're, we're moving healthcare to, tech, tech, to just tactics. And so what they did was a number of things. They started with something simple, because often these things have to be simple. They called it a no passing rule, meaning anybody in the hospital who sees that red call light on a person's room, whether you're a doctor, someone delivering flowers, somebody fixing a sink, you have to go in and take care of that human. We need symbolic actions that are no questions asked that start to build and raise the water level for everyone. They also um, changed everybody's title 
it used to be in healthcare that the only people that got the title caregiver was doctors. Now everybody is a caregiver. So if you're delivering flowers and you see somebody's pillow is rumpled, you are a caregiver. So fix the pillow, get them some water. You're not going to be ticked along just based on check, check, check the tactics. The other thing that they've done, which they, they're never, they're not stopping. They continuously are also looking at the things to reduce the human frailty in the experience. Um, for example, one of the things that they installed was something they call Nick view cameras. So if you have to leave the hospital without your newborn baby, you're worried about that kid. There is now a camera over the crib of your baby and you can watch that baby 24 seven from home if you want to. And on and on and on it goes. And, and so those are my, my big three. There are three very provocative ones and, and obviously you've had dealings with them. So it's always great to see the wizard behind the curtain as well. For the sake of time in this discussion, we are going to have a time to reloop and do kind of a, a free for all session between all of us. But I'd love to get to the last two discussions and, and maybe they'll pivot from experience and technology to combine them both. Um, so thanks, Gene. And I'm going to move to Lars now in terms of just talking about engagement, which, which may mean customer engagement. I guess it may be an employee engagement, depending on which examples you've chosen, Lars. Um, oh. Same type of format. Um, why is engagement, whether it's customer or employee, so important? Then perhaps that should be the first question, because uh, I believe I have a rather different definition of engagement because you can discuss uh, customer engagement, uh, employment engagement, but from my perspective, I would like to narrow it down to leadership engagement, meaning that uh, a lot of change, a lot of the future uh, is because of technology and what you can do on the marketplace and you can find new areas. But if we look from a more European perspective, you also have a discussion that leaders, CEOs, top management for companies have to have a more engaged and meaningful definition of the role of the company. Uh, so when I'm talking about engagement, as an example, would be that company proactively goes in and create a strategy to take care of some of the serious issues in the world, not just customers and yourselves and entertainment, but actually to deal with some of the serious issues. So engagement, in my terms, as an example, uh, companies actually go in and uh, commit themselves to UN's uh, sustainability uh, development 2030. And what we can see in Europe and especially in Denmark, there have been a huge change for the last six or seven months. So now companies, our government go in and make serious decisions and have serious ambition about how to change the society. So by me, of course, it should be nice for customers. Of course, it should be nice for the company, but it should also be good for your society and your environment. So, so, so that's my point of view or take for, for engagement. I like it. It's the third rail of engagement here, I guess, because it does, uh, I, I found in my writing of Wikibrands 10 years ago, if you, if you don't have leadership on board, uh, as much as you can have some of this bottom up stuff happen, it really is challenging, isn't it? Um, yes. 2019 is the Greta Thunberg year. I think what you're talking about is quite prescient right now. Um, yes. Are there, go ahead. Yes. So, so what I can see now, and that will also, uh, you have uh, seen a change in attitude. So it was something nice to, to need to. And now you can see companies actually engage, uh, commit resources, uh, change the organization, make a product development that not only benefit their customers, but at the same time, actually also the employees and the society. And I believe that we will we'll see, see a more uh, high commitment to this one. And that's also for me a part of uh, 
making companies ready for the future. And of course, technology is a part of that. Uh, of course, uh, customer understandings is a part of that. But it's another way of increasing in trying to create a better world. Are there two or three examples that you have that may bring this idea to life? Yes. Uh, I can take some examples from the Nordic countries. We have a very huge company, uh, Ørsted, who have stopped only want to use uh, green energy, only use uh, wind power, solar energy, and then stop totally by using coal and, uh, uh, and oil. Uh, and then expanding worldwide. Uh, we have uh, also a group of the company named Grunfoss making pumps, uh, who are very, very much committed to change their business model. Uh, and they'll try to solve the problem about, make sure that uh, all citizens uh, in the world have access to clean water. Uh, uh, but actually what is going to happen is that that is not without cost, you know. So when they change the business model, uh, they will have an increased pressure on uh, their price structure. So actually they believe that they can create so much value by doing so that they can get a higher price. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated. I mean, and you've got two examples here that aren't North American, which is great. Um, I don't know I'm if you know the inner workings of both those companies, but I'm fascinated when a company decides we have to do something about this. And, and is it a magic moment uh, scenario or is it over a period of time where this change starts to happen for engagement? I would say that uh, uh, it's had been a discussion uh, over time, but right now uh, the top agenda in Denmark and most of Europe would be how to engage seriously. So it had a lot of speeds the, uh, the last part of 2019. So now it's uh, gone from being a nice discussion, good intention to real action, uh, but also a broad commitment, you know, so not just you can pick one company, but actually you can see that it is a movement between the, the dinosaurs, <laughs> because it's normally quite established companies who is going to make this change and actually also trying to stress their own business model because they need to find new ways so they can get a little higher price because it costs something to do it in the right way uh, concerning the environment. Uh, so, so it's a movement, but now that they're moving fast, especially in Europe. It almost goes back to John's kind of quote about technology. It's like uh, the, the big guys versus the startups. Can you rewire yourself in tech uh, terms? Or in this case, can you repurpose yourself in terms of corporate terms to, to be faster than the startups on a disengagement front? Yes, but, but at the same time, it's also more like a leadership statement. You know, it's not just about creating growth and earn profit. You also have to do it in the right way. So you have to cry, create the right value, you have to benefit your society, you have to benefit for future generation. So uh, it's more like, I would say, a way between uh, executives that they want to commit to that. Wonderful, all right. Um, I'm gonna move on to the fourth part of our discussion today and then we'll, we'll spend some time at the end. Um, just kind of giving our, our advice to the future, I guess. Um, thanks for that, Lars. Um, okay. And Andrea, I know you've, uh, you're have you playing the role of platform cop today, um, and you're probably um, loving the fact that uh, Gene had brought up uh, Stitch Fix, who you worked with in the past, so maybe this is one of yours as well. Talk to me about platforms. Why are platforms gonna be so important toward the future? Well, I think that there's a couple of things. That there's so much to talk about that everybody just mentioned, John and Jean and Lars. There's just, we could go on for hours um, in the post conversation. Um, but I think about platforms, there's actually something everybody said about this topic that I think is really important. And I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a blend as I establish this. I mean, one of the things that I think is amazing about what Lars just said is related to platforms is the transparency of all of our data. Right. So platforms, I mean, we're naked. 
There's just, there's no company that can hide. I know when I, I was just in Denmark for a few weeks and, you know, you kind of get shamed if you talk about capitalism with too much greed as the subtext. You know, people look at you in horror, like, what are you doing? Um, and I think that, that there is this sense of a platform being a place where it, it can be a great equalizer because of the transparency. So I think that's one reason. I think the reason this is categorically why this category is important is that there have recently been, well, up until recently, I should say, the technology didn't allow these platforms to provide what we what the promise had been, the network effect, right? Where all of the people in the platforms were supposed to all benefit. Actually, it was kind of a greedy platform in the old days. It was, we've got closed source software. You can't have it. It's, we're not going to open it up. So I think what John said about Allbirds is really interesting, you know, to just to say, look, it's an open world out there and platforms have to now stop being the greedy platform like it's our IP and you can't steal it and we're going to own everything to now, okay, now that the platform is a bit of a shared game, now what are we going to do to differentiate? And I think that there's a, there's a model and actually what Airbnb is doing that's a, a very different from the way platforms started out. Airbnb has been able to plant seeds for many, many people to make lots of wonderful businesses, almost mom and pop local businesses by, you know, a cleaning service that Airbnb doesn't own people who are small vendors, Airbnb doesn't own, but here I am in Toronto in an Airbnb, and I know there's someone who's going to clean the place when I leave, and that is going to be a local vendor. And so it allows for a platform to be very different in structure than we're Microsoft, you better use our, our, plat our software, buy it once, be addicted to it, and we're, you know, one size fits all, and that's too bad. This, this transparency is really important. And I think what Laura said about a decision, you know, this notion of leaders observing what's in the in the market and let's use salesforce as an example of another model for platforms so i imagine that mark benioff although i don't know him personally i did read his book um and he's right in san francisco where i live i imagine that they saw the same thing all of us saw which is people have a thirst in this era of data and everybody talking about how much we want data we actually can't understand it very well. <laughs> there's too much of it. So, you know, there's the way that platforms can now be used to generate meaning in a, de in a democratic way. So, for instance, they just acquired Tableau. I'm guessing, although they didn't consult me, <laughs> that they did it because they observed that more and more people had more and more data and couldn't figure out, like, should we buy low and sell high? Or should we buy high and sell low? Like, what's going on? And data visualization, because of all this data that the platforms now have, has become a really leading indicator of what's important. And so I would imagine that platforms now have to provide, number one, you know, ways for you to seed ecosystems that you don't own, because that's a philosophically important thing. That's the Airbnb model. Number two, the ability to make sense of data, you know, so you don't own everything but like the Tableau and Salesforce model. Um, I think this notion of network effect is really important. Um, and I think that the, uh, the Allbirds example of, you know, understanding that you can use a platform to expose leadership transparency and the comfort and the company intent. And I think the final thing is kind of different, but it's Alibaba of all things. There's a model where I do think that in China, and this book that I love to quote, which is The Big Nine by Amy Webb that we didn't write, Sean, but we should have, um, is about, you know, this notion of platforms and, and different models. I mean, China has carved out very explicitly a systems approach to platforms, right? So Alibaba, you know, everybody knows in one day they made $31 billion on Singles Day. Like, that's crazy, right? $31 billion is the GNP of most nations times 10, probably. However... They do have kind of a Tencent, Alibaba, Didi, you know, just different, different, uh, um, different companies that have carved out this platform approach in very specific ways with a long-term point, uh, um, with a long-term vantage point. So I think that we have different models for platforms, and I, I really think the same thing that, you know, the, the, the notion of platforms eat pipelines. I think the days of pipelines are gone. The days of one size fits all platforms are gone. 
And I think we're in this era of four or five different models of platforms that are, because we're so exposed, it's, it's, and because we are in the emperor's new clothes, like we are naked, it's going to hopefully reinforce the good behavior that leadership should embrace, as Lars was mentioning. So I think platforms is a great way to tie together today's themes. Can I uh, just do one, uh, maybe get a one quick follow-up from you as well? And I'll accuse Silicon Valley, where you're located, not today, but normally, as being maybe the biggest defender of this. Um, platforms, for me, sometimes mean winner takes all, right? It, it, they, platforms kind of start out as being like this, wow, we're going to get crowds together and it's going to be a great shared thing. And it's going to be, you know, Wikipedia in some respects is the embodiment of that, where everybody benefits and not too many people abuse the advantage of being most of the platforms have kind of been more, I got to number one and I became the incumbent that then erased number two, three, and four. Uh, what's the future of platforms? Are, are there going to be multiple platforms and marketplaces or is it truly still winner takes all? Well, I think that, as you said, the winner takes all. There was a, a children's book called Yertle the Turtle. And he um, was a turtle who would climb on the backs of other turtles until he was like the tallest turtle of all. And he was the king of everything he could see until the turtles decided, hey, get off my back. And then it all fell down. Um, that's kind of the way I'm seeing platforms these days. I, I watched it in IoT pretty, pretty intensely. Um, you know, the Internet of Things where, oh, it's going to be the GE platform. It's going to be the ABB. Plat you know, everybody thought their platform would win. So my prediction for 2020 is enough of that. And I think what John said, what Gene said, and what Lars said is all about, hey, guys, we know what you stand for. Your behavior is not going to be tolerated. Um, Allbirds and, and, and uh, Amazon was like a really great moment of like, okay, there's a David and there's a Goliath and we all have to play nice. Um, so I, I, actually, I actually think that the days of the one the winner takes all are over. I think I, I just... I, I just don't think that um, that uh, cybersecurity and privacy are too important for people, and I just don't think they're going to that that the that the people are going to allow one person, you know, one force to be in charge of everything, with the exception of China, where they've Great carved answer. it out. And I'm also <laughs> impressed in the fact that you've taken ten episodes to use your your role, the turtle as a metaphor for something that you want to say. I mean, you're, you've been holding back, so. I I'm just a deep intellectual. I just, I just wanted to kind of, you know, go to the intellectual plane there. Uh, for the, the little time that we have left, I'd love to, I know we haven't heard from John for a while and we've kind of done this in kind of a set of four, but I'd love to uh, maybe ask each one of our panelists to play the synthesis role for a minute within their specific thing, but also based on what you've heard. Are there, are there learnings, impressions about um, what the next decade is going to look like uh, based on what you've heard from your other panelists and, and having, having that marinate in your mind for a while, John? I still think it's an amazing time to do a startup. I still think it's an amazing time to, in all the chaos and complexity, in all the competing narratives and competing platforms, to do a startup, but from a, from a, from a, country perspective from a, a region perspective it's the only way to be successful and to be effective um, we do have to moderate what capitalism looks like to what Lars was saying we do have to change the behavior of platforms to what Andrea was saying and I love a lot of what Gene was saying about how experience matters ultimately if we're going to succeed in the future at being creating societies that are equitable at living sustainably on our planet we need so much more innovation we need targeted innovation engineering efforts around energy around pollution around um, creation of jobs and assignment of value to things that we need to live sustainably and I think the only way to do that is by creating many, many startups and having some kind of evolutionary principle there. So some will fail, some will succeed in feeding uh, the winners and then making sure that we distribute those, uh, the, 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 the profits from those in some way that is more equitable than what we've seen in the past. Interesting. I'm, I'm glad you stepped out of your, your tech bracket there too. That was a, uh... You might be running for 2028 election based on something like <laughs> gang, that. Gang, gang. 
<laughs> Dean, same question to you. Uh, the powers of synthesis and good listening. I, I know all my panelists are good listeners. What have you heard today? Uh, what are you now simulating about, uh, about the future? Well, the, the big word for me and the direction that I think is critical, you've all mentioned it, both John and Lars, is admiration. Building an admirable way of recognizing and knowing how you're going to improve lives and being very clear from a leadership standpoint about what you will do and what you won't do. Um, having a set of non-negotiables, I think rare leaders live um, with these guide wires and as a result come out the other side a different kind of company. It, that's what I, what I want to see. That's what I'm pushing people toward. That's what I think that um, will not only change the world, but will change the ecos and the ethos, the ethos of organizations. Um, so it's, it's a little high, high strong, but I, I really think that's where we need to push this work. Are you a betting person? Is that going to happen? I think it's going to happen for some, not all. I think it'll still be a few great leaders and the rest looking at them and um, picking tactics off. Uh, but I, I hope there's a bigger pack of great leaders who are, who are really building for this admirable growth. I, I, I think that we need more examples of it. Wonderful. And Lars, um, I love the European perspective. In some respects, um, maybe I shouldn't be surprised that Greta Thunberg's from Sweden and you know, you're talking about uh, taking engagement in a completely different direction than maybe I thought today. So, um, first of all, I guess, is Europe our, uh, our beacon of hope um, based on the discussion I had with Gene? And what, what's your synthesis powers from today's discussion? Mm, I, I believe that we have a huge uh, shared interest. Uh, so, basically, it will come come down to the same that the technology will create great opportunities. I totally agree with John that uh, a lot of it we'll see from startups because we need this amount of uh, uh, people with good ideas and who's willing to make the experiments. Uh, uh, I also believe that we should have the courage and that's on all levels and not only on company levels also among uh, uh, presidents and prime ministers and so on should have the courage actually also to address some of the more serious issues. Then I have a last point regarding engagement because there's a lot of discussion about technology and new technology and how to compete but in London a lot of people downtown are talking about fintech platform and how they can uh, compete with the financial sector and so on but just outside, you have engaged startup where you have local economy because you have a lousy welfare system. So there you have small companies training people uh, uh, with no money and a lot of insecurity how to start up your own business without borrow money. They do it for free with some funding. So you have what we can call local economy trying to create job opportunities for people outside London. That's, from my perspective, engaged startup. It's not high tech, but engaged trying to make a change for some people living uh, uh, in more bad neighborhoods in London. Well, I think we're doing a project on the future of work now, and I think there are some business meets society things like that, Lars, that I think are going to hit themselves very shortly, not like something that we have to deal with 15 years, but now, right? Yeah. Andrea, you have um, great powers of synthesis um, given our authorship together. What have you learned from today? I'm always impressed when people from very different backgrounds have this sense that we can all as leaders do better. I, d I just think that there's, I, I was almost on the verge of tears um, listening to people because really this notion of purpose that Jean talked about, this notion of responsibility to a greater societal uh, issue of uh, greater societal issues and get out of my sort of Silicon Valley bubble that Lars, I mean, he didn't say it that way, but you know, that Lars hinted at. And I think that John's notion of, you know, the way that he um, has a vantage point on uh, shifting forces in, in, I would say leadership in general. So I'm, I'm actually very inspired. I have a lot to think about and, and there's not as much synthesis as 
feeling of optimism, believe it or not, for 2020. And this is a woman who lives in the United States. So we're not in a very optimistic week right now. Um, it's a challenging time for us. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, so I feel a lot of optimism based on everybody's input. All right. Uh, the one minute uh, that we have left, um, first of all, I want to eternally thank our panelists. Um, we've managed to get 12 panelists from around the world today. And it's so good when you don't have to give too much of a briefing and people say yes. And you guys said yes today. So thank you for stepping up to the plate. Um, the conversation continues in January. We will have a platform where we'll allow hundreds of others to actually nominate their faves. And we'll try to ferret out in 12 different categories who the top 10 future proofing people are in each category. Lars, I will change the description of what engagement means for, um, for everybody else so um, it's more inclusive. Um, and Andrew, you've already spoken. Um, we'll hopefully declare some winners come April. We've also defined kind of what our research objectives selfishly are from uh, Future Proofing Next. So we are currently engaged in future of work discussions with about 30 people around the world. It will move in springtime to AI. Then uh, I know, John, you're a sports fan, so maybe I'll hit you up for a digiball, which is kind of marrying sport and technology and where it all goes. And then we'll, we'll end up at the final part of the year talking about scale and growth with a number of other people and, and hopefully scaling and growth in a good way. Very shameless plug, myself and Andrea are hobbled together in an Airbnb today trying to figure out the last two innings of our book. Um, and so um, we've got a book coming out on February 10th. So I know um, some of you have books. Gene certainly has books. John's even, have you, have you got a book or do you just are part of many different books? I've, I'm part of many books. I've written a novel, science fiction, by the way, and I'm working on Insights from the Future, which is a book of future news. Wow, nice. All right. Well, we'll plug it here when uh, that comes out. And Lars, uh, where, what's your bookishness? I love to be together with executives, you know, so I only make articles and I have made a leadership manifesto, but my life is too short to make books, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I know. I know. And do people read books? I think they still do. But um, yeah. And then, Gene, I know it's Would You Do That to Your Mother uh, was uh, the book from, I think, last year. Are you working on a new book? No. I mean, the, the seminal book I wrote was called Chief Customer Officer and Chief Customer Officer 2.0. That's still the first book most people are buying when they're beginning to, to lead their transformation. It's a, been a great honor. And I must be having a very short life, Lars, because I wrote four books. Maybe I'm about to die. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I do uh, have that we'll book on my book. Where the, I, we'll see where Three Blocks Long goes. That may be a book, but I want to I make sure it, it, it helps people and resonates. Wonderful. Yeah. Right now, I'm really about getting the content out there. Uh, we have an expert network, so maybe uh, either one of you three people want to be part of our uh, kind of guild of sorts. This is our round table of people around the world that um, tackle big challenges with us, like what we're talking about today. We have already had one webcast today. We're having another one in about an hour's time about business models, ecosystems, talent, and transformation. And myself and Andrea have pegged out two topics for January to be webcast discussions as well. And... We've had our Q&A. So I, once again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to thank Andrea for playing the role of platforms. And uh, until we meet again in the future, um, where it's hopefully going to be very optimistic and prosperous for all of us. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Thank Thanks. You.